Good. Whoa. That was even louder than normal. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you here on this beautiful Lord's Day. This is the first Sunday in Advent, and I think you're going to be glad that you came today. We have a special service today that is going to make much of Christ. We have a guest preacher that Pastor Daniel will be introducing in a little while. We also have the student band. You can see them behind me. They have a few songs that they're going to share with us, and they're going to be leading us in worship, so we'll have the opportunity to join them in song in just a moment. But as we begin, I'd like to share from the Gospel of John. This is chapter 1, verse 14. The word of the Lord says this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this morning, we're going to be singing about Christ. We're going, going to be singing to Christ, and our students are going to lead us. There's a new song that they're introducing to us that we're going to be singing this Advent season a handful of times. It's called Sing We the Song of Emmanuel. So at this time, would you stand, and we will uh, worship along with the student band. <laughs>
Amen. Didn't they do a great job? Amen. You, you may be seated. Christ is born for you. O come all you unfaithful. A lot of times we sing, O come all ye faithful, and that's true. But also, for those who are unfaithful, for those that Christ has yet to redeem, for those who have not placed their faith, hope, and their trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, they may also come. O oh, come all you unfaithful. It's a, a great reminder to us this Advent season. Uh, before I move on from the student band, I wanted to thank our student band leaders. Uh, Cassie Eccleston is leading this group, and she has a team 
of folks with her. The newest uh, adult is Michaela Parker, who was a student just last year, and now she is back to help lead along with uh, Stacy Palmer, who handles a lot of our communication with the student band, which is a, a big job, and my wife, Abby, and uh, I'm also uh, around and do a couple things here and there. I think I got everybody. Cassie, is that everybody? Where is she? I think that's everybody. Well, it is Advent, so it's time for our Advent reading. This is our first candle, and um, I would like to introduce uh, Robbie and Hannah Leslie, who will be reading our first Advent reading of the season. Advent means coming. As we anticipate the coming of Christmas, we light a different Advent candle each of the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. The gradual increase in light reflects our growing anticipation of celebrating Jesus' birth. Today we light the first Advent candle, the candle of prophecy. This candle represents the prophecy of Jesus coming to earth. There are well over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Today's scripture is a prophecy about the coming Messiah from Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, of there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and, and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of the host will do this. We thank God today for his prophecies about Jesus first come through the earth. We thank God for fulfilling those prophecies through his son, Jesus, we also thank God for his prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus on earth. We look forward to the return of Jesus and seeing him face to face. We anticipate the celebration of his birth. And we... All right. And we anticipate his return to earth. We... For he has become our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that um, at the beginning of time when Jesus and the Holy Spirit were there with you, um, you had a plan um, to create us and then for our Creator to become our Savior. And so, God, we praise you for that. We thank you that... Um, the prophecies are all fulfilled in the person of Jesus, and it just shows um, your mighty hand and your planning. And God, you knew looking back that there would be some who would question the deity of Jesus. And these prophecies remind us that those couldn't have been fulfilled in one man um, over time if it hadn't been divine. And so we thank you that Jesus is fully man and fully God, and that through this Advent season, we get to look forward um, to the reminder that Jesus came as a baby um, but that he was born to die for our sins. And God, we thank you so much that you made a way for us to be forgiven, that you made a way for us to be healed, um, that you made a way for us to be righteous in Christ. God, we praise you so much for who you are. Thank you for who you are um, on the best days and on the worst days and on the mundane days, um, that you care for us and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our sequence this morning has been a bit unusual. Thank, thankfully, we got to hear from our students today. My name is Daniel. I'm the lead pastor here at North Roanoke. And uh, prior to uh, the start of our service, I saw many guests. If you are one of those guests, we want to give you a warm North Roanoke welcome. There's a green card in the chair pocket in front of you. It says, welcome. If you'd be so kind as to just drop your name and a, a number or an email address, we'd love to follow up with you and see what God's up to in your life. Today we have a, an incredibly special treat, a, a great privilege of hearing from Dr. Paul Chitwood, who is the president of the International Mission Board. I like to say at North Roanoke, we want to be Christ's church. We want to apply ourselves to what the Bible says the church should be and do. Uh, we want to impact the Roanoke Valley where we live, and we want to reach the world. We want to reach all the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the 
primary ways we're committed to doing that is through our support of the International Mission Board. Uh, a significant portion of our budget goes directly to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering Sunday by Sunday by Sunday. And uh, I want to commend you for being generous so far in 2023. I want to encourage you to continue to do so. I want to introduce Dr. Chitwood and then I will... Um, we, we go through prayer points, Dr. Chitwood, every, every Sunday, and we're going to pray for some missionaries in Israel as well. Dr. Chitwood was elected president of the International Mission Board in November of 2018. He had previously served as executive director of the Kentucky Baptist Convention since 2011. For the 18 years prior to that, he served as the pastor of local churches of varying sizes in Kentucky. During his pastorates, he served as the chairman of the International Mission Board, their trustees, from 2008 to 2010, which was a part of his overall tenure as a trustee from 2002 to 2010. A native of Jellicoe, Tennessee, he's a 1992 graduate of Cumberland College, and he earned the Master of Divinity and Ph.D. degrees from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'll have to forgive that, Ethan. Um, not everyone can go to Southeastern just kidding. And a master's degree in nonprofit administration from the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. He served as a faculty member of the seminary between 2002 and 2018. He and his wife, Michelle, who is an advocate I have recently learned for foster care and adoption, uh, they have four children. So, Dr. Chitwood, we're so thankful you're here. Later in the service, you can just come up and bring the word. Uh, at this time, I want to tell you about some missionaries we've got serving in Israel. Uh, I think their names are going to be on the screen, Ben and Christy. I don't believe those are, are their actual names, but uh, for security reasons, those are the names we're going to use to pray for them today. Uh, this uh, prayer prompt was produced before the conflict that's, that's raging and brewing in Israel. Uh, God has blessed them to be able to share the gospel uh, with Jews in, in Jerusalem, and they have seen come, some come to saving faith in Christ. Obviously, their circumstances and situation are a bit more precarious now than when this uh, prayer prompter was produced. And so we're going to pray uh, as they magnify Jesus, uh, the true temple of God, right? The, pe the people of God have been made, remade in the Spirit of God to be the temple of God, and they are right there in Jerusalem proclaiming that they can come into the temple by faith in Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me as we pray for them? God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for Dr. Chitwood, his willingness to be with us today. We thank you for all of the staff and missionaries that he represents. And God, we pray for the safety and effectiveness of our missionaries around the world. And specifically today, we pray, God, for Ben and Christy as they are there to magnify Christ in the, in the heart of Israel and there to testify that their Messiah has come and that he is welcoming all uh, who will enter in through repentance and faith. And God, we pray that uh, they would see a great harvest of souls through their faithful service to you. And God, we, we want to worship you this day in spirit and truth. And we are thankful for the opportunity to be inspired, encouraged, and reminded uh, about what it's like to be a church that is reaching the nations through our giving and our praying and, God, our going. We pray you would continue to raise up men and women, boys and girls from this church to go and uh, be a part of your harvesters among the nations. We ask it in Jesus' name because he's worthy of it. Amen. Let's stand once again. Thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee, Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth. Thou art dear desire of joy of every longing heart. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy grace 
gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone by thine all sufficient merit raise us to thy glorious us to thy glorious silence with glory in the highest the hope of all creation resting in his mother's arms a song on the horizon ringing through the heavens the long-awaited savior Come to set the captives free. Come to set the captives free. Come set us free. Hope has a name, Emmanuel, the light of the world who broke through the darkness. All hail the King.
Church, you can be seated. And uh, at this time, we'll welcome Dr. Paul Chitwood. Hey, good morning, and thank you for that warm welcome. What a joy it is to be with you, North Roanoke. Uh, how grateful I am for the privilege of being able to share with you today. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, worship team. Jesse, wow, what a voice. Uh, it's powerful. I hope has a name. And we turn our attention to the Lord today and to his word. We're reminded that the name of Jesus in far too many places of the world has not yet been heard. And where his name has not been heard, there is no hope. And today our focus is upon why what we are doing together to declare the name of Jesus and his gospel among the nations is so important. And speaking of what we're doing together, I want to say thank you. And indeed, Pastor Daniel, as you referenced, this church is an incredibly generous church in partnering with the International Mission Board. What, what that means is not only did you have a witness here in your community this year, and certainly uh, through your work with Virginia Baptist, Southern Baptist, you extend that witness. But, but through the IMB, your witness was extended this past year to 122 countries around the world. And on behalf of those 3,550 IMB missionaries who were that witness in 122 countries around the world, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers for them, even as you prayed this morning. Thank you for your generosity and supporting their needs, ensuring that not only those 3,550 missionaries, but their 2,700 kids have everything they need as they have gone out from among us to the very ends of the earth to share the gospel. You're getting a good return on that investment. Uh, this past year, more than 700,000 people heard the gospel through those missionaries and their Baptist partners on the ground. 178,000 came to faith, Amen. professing the Lord Jesus as their Savior. So I celebrate it with you. Those are your missionaries. That is your work. And what a joy it is for me today uh, to be here with you and celebrate what God is doing, not only here, but to the very ends of the earth. Thank you, Pastor Daniel, for your ministry. Uh, you and Stacy being here now, you say seven, eight years? It's right at eight years. Uh, church, aren't you grateful to have a pastor who leads you in such a faithful way. And great job by the kids uh, who uh, led us in worship. Well, listen, as we turn our attention to God's Word this morning, with that question in mind, why, uh, as we think about missions, as we think about uh, the IMB, as we think about the nations, why is that work so important? Why is the work that we're doing together so important? I want to turn your attention to the passage of Scripture in the book of Romans, chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, I'll begin in verse 9 in just a moment, but let me set a little of the context uh, for this passage uh, for you. If you're familiar with the book of Romans, you know that the Apostle Paul does a lot in that book. Uh, he gives great clarity to the gospel, really traces through salvation history and what God has planned before the foundations of the earth were set in place, helps us to understand the church and missions. And one of the things that Paul does, while it certainly is a blessing to any who read his words, which are, in fact, God's word to us. But one of the things that Paul does in the book of Romans is something that for him is very personal. As he is dealing with the matter of his own people, Paul was a Jew. Paul was an Israelite. And what Paul recognized is that he was one of the few Jews who had come to faith in Jesus. And that, as God had said, he would bring the Messiah from among the Jews, and he had done that. It was also the case that most of the Jews, most of the Israelites, rejected Jesus as Messiah. They did not believe in him. And so Paul uh, struggles a bit and questions, in fact, not only here in Romans, but in his other letters, what does this mean for all the promises of God to the Jewish people? I mean, as you read through the Old Testament, you can see that it is, it is chock full of promises that God makes to the Jews, the Israelites. Uh, he chooses them, his elect, to do a great work in them, makes many promises to them, but the greatest work in all of history, the work of saving humankind through 
the gift of Jesus in laying down his life for us, becoming the sacrifice for our sins, the Jews by and large had rejected. So what does this mean for the promises that God has made? Will those promises be kept? As you read Paul's reflections, what you will ultimately be able to see is that Paul does believe all those promises that God has made that the Israelites will be kept because God keeps every promise God has ever made. God's not a liar. God does what God says he will do. But here in Romans 3, we also see very clearly that the fact that God has made promises to the Israelites as a people does not exclude any individual, whether they are a Jew or not, from responsibility for their own sin and for what we do with Jesus as the Savior. So that's the context here. Picking up in Romans 3, beginning in verse 9, Paul, who is, who is uh, wrestling with and dealing with these questions, uh, asked in verse 9, are we Jews any better off? No, he says, not at all. That is, are we better off than those who aren't Jews, the Greeks, the Gentiles, everyone else? For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps or of snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. And if those words aren't condemning enough, don't miss verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Well, with strong words, uh, Paul makes the point not just once, but over and over and over again. That the reality is, whether you're a Jew or not, we're all in the same boat. And that boat is the boat of sin. We have all sin and fallen short, and, and because of that, our relationship with God is broken. We refer to that as being lost. And as Paul deals with this issue, really, he's, he's, he's not only talking uh, about the condition of the Jews, but he's talking about, obviously, the condition of everyone else, and what, what he's ultimately doing is is putting his finger on what is one of the greatest problems in our world today. In fact, it's the greatest problem in our world. Now, if I were to ask you what, in your opinion, is the world's greatest problem, there's probably lots of things that would begin to, uh, to go through your mind. It doesn't take but uh, just a few minutes of me reading through the headlines every day uh, on my phone, or if I can even stand to watch a television newscast, <laughs> before I'm almost clinically depressed as I think about all the problems facing our world. Uh, we have the wars Pastor Daniel's already referenced in the Middle East, uh, the prolonged war in Eastern Europe, uh, the suffering of so many people, and the growing number of refugees, not only from these conflicts, but from so many other conflicts around the world. In fact, there are more displaced peoples on planet Earth today than any time in human history. More than 100 million people have had to flee their home, many of them their home country, because of wars and famines and unrest and genocide. And don't miss the fact that 43 million of those are children. What does it look like to live as a child who is a, a refugee? You may not be aware of the fact that there are actually more slaves on planet Earth today than any time in human history. More enslaved, almost 50 million people live as forced laborers in our world today. What an overwhelming problem. The problems of human trafficking, the problem of global hunger. This is a, a growing problem. In fact, we're facing a hunger crisis around the world that we haven't seen in four decades. As many as two billion people in the world today will struggle to have a single meal to eat. 345 million, we're told, are on the verge of starving to death right now today. Now, those overwhelming problems, I mean, you just said mind-boggling. How do you solve problems like that? 
And yet none of the things I mentioned are the greatest problem facing our world. The greatest problem facing our world today, I could communicate to you in a single word. And that word is lostness. Spiritual lostness. The condition of human beings who have sinned against God, rebelled against God, and their relationship with their Creator is broken. Now why would I say... While people are literally fleeing for their lives from bullets and bombs, while there are people who are being trafficked, while uh, there are people who are living as slaves, while there are people who are literally on the verge of starvation, why would I say that a spiritual condition is the world's greatest problem? Because that's what the Bible says. There are lots of reasons that that statement is true. But I want to highlight just two for you today. And the first is this. When you think about spiritual lostness as a problem in our world, it is the world's greatest problem because it's the problem that lasts. Do you know almost every problem in your life ends the moment you die? <laughs> it's not a novel thought, is it? But, but, but think about it for a moment. Uh, we're, at least those of us who are sports fans, or, are uh, paying attention today to who makes it in the college football playoffs. Well, brother, even if Alabama doesn't make it, if you die today, you won't care. My vols are out. That hurt me. But if I die today, I won't care. Whatever your team is, you stop caring about those things the moment life on earth is over. Every problem, the, the lower back pain, it's gone the moment you die. Problems in your family, problems in your marriage, problems at work, problems at school, they're over the moment you die. Every problem in your life ends the moment you die, but one, if you die lost, the magnitude of that problem only sets in the moment you die. What does that mean? The Bible says that God is love. What would it be like to face eternity with no love and no source of love? That is the hatred of hell. The Bible says that the Spirit of God is our comforter. What would it be like to face forever with no comfort, no source of comfort in your life? That's the agony and the suffering that the Scriptures describe as hell. The Bible says that Christ is our joy. and We're celebrating that joy this holiday season, and yet what would it be like to face forever with no joy? That is the sorrow and the grieving that the Scriptures describe as hell. The Bible says Jesus is your life. What would it be like to face forever separated from the source of life? The Bible describes hell as the place of eternal dying, of eternal death. This is the only problem that lasts, and it lasts forever. And that's why lostness is the greatest problem in our world today. But there's another reason. In fact, several, but I always just highlight one more as we look again to Romans 3, and it is this. Lostness is everyone's problem. It's a universal problem. There's no one who is exempt from this problem. Paul is making that point. He's asking his questions about the Jews. Are you better off? No, we've already charged that all. Listen, I'm going to track through three or four verses here. You're going to hear Paul say the same thing in different ways nine times. Verse 11, we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Or verse 9. Verse 10, as is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, no one understands, no one seeks for God. Verse 12, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. And if anyone was reading Paul's letter back then or, or hearing it read today and thinking to themselves or you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, that's probably true of everyone else, but not me. Paul is going to use an illustration here uh, to uh, convince us otherwise. 
It's the same illustration that James uses in James chapter 3, where James and Paul both are essentially going to say this. You think I'm not talking about you? <laughs> you think you've lived a perfect life? You're, you, you, you've not seen you've not done anything wrong? Would you consider just for a moment your words, your tongue? If Paul was alive today, he might say it like this. Why don't you record yourself talking for a while and play it back? <laughs> And then you'll know it's you too. Read an interesting article a few months ago from the Atlantic magazine. It was the title of the article that caught my attention. I thought, I need to read that article. The article was entitled, Why the Past Ten Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. <laughs> I thought, I need to see what that guy has to say. Uh, well, that guy is a guy by the name of Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. And, and it was fascinating to me because uh, it's not a Christian article, but, but, but the author of the article, Jonathan Haidt, as he began to talk about the problems in our culture and our society and in our country, referenced a Bible passage. Uh, it's a record from the Old Testament about the Tower of Babel. Do you remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Uh, it, it was a time on the earth when, when all the people of the earth came together and they wanted to do something great. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And so they determined they would have a building project. <laughs> and the building project would be a tower. And they wanted to build a tower that would reach to the heavens, a tower that would reach to God. But if you remember that story, you'll recall that things did not turn out the way they thought they would. Because this building project that brought the people together ended up driving them apart. So much so that even their languages were confused and they couldn't even communicate with one another. God confused their languages. What's fascinating, the author of the article used that Old Testament story to make a point about social media. He pointed to social media as one of the things that for the last 10 years have made American life uniquely stupid. He, 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 said, he said this was supposed to bring us together. You know, we, we, we talk about uh, Facebook friends, right? But what an unfriendly place <laughs> Facebook can be. And, and he said what was supposed to bring us together has driven us apart. But as he came to the end of the article... While I had enjoyed it up until that point, I thought, oh, no, you missed the point. You, you didn't finish the article. Because the problem is not Facebook and the problem is not social media. It's not Twitter or X or whatever platform, Insta, as my girls say. It's, 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 it's none of that. It's not the screen. It's not the keyboard. No, the problem is here. It's a problem of the heart. Because the words simply reveal, whether they are typed or spoken, they simply reveal the sinfulness of our heart. Jesus said as much. He was speaking to a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus, well, he began with a little name calling. He said, you Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, how can you who are evil do anything good, say anything good? Because out of the overflow of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth speaks. Your words, Jesus says, simply reveal your heart. Now it's fascinating that as Jesus referred to the Pharisees as a bunch of snakes, a brood of vipers, in talking about their words. Paul uses that same imagery here in Romans 3. Did you pick up on that? Uh, Paul says their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Listen, the venom of asps or of snakes is under their lips. Anyone have a good snake story? <laughs> I have several. <laughs> but, but my best one comes from my teenage years. I grew up, as uh, Pastor Daniel mentioned, in Angelico, Tennessee. It's actually... It's a little washed up coal mining town in the mountains right on the Tennessee-Kentucky line. Half of the town of 2000 is in Kentucky and half of it's in Tennessee. But when I was a, a boy growing up, in fact, I believe it was between my seventh and eighth grade years, 
I'd heard about a summer camp experience all the way over at the other end of Tennessee, down in western Tennessee, towards Memphis, Tennessee, that, that very much got my attention. It was conservation camp. Uh, I'd learned uh, about conservation camp, uh, some things that had, had me interested in wanting to spend a week or two in conservation camp uh, that summer. Uh, one of the things I heard about conservation camp is you get to dissect a beaver in conservation camp. In the mind of a teenage boy, I don't know. But, but <laughs> what I did not know is that the beaver would be frozen and have to be thawed out in the bathtub in my cabin. But we thawed it out and we dissected it. It was a good time. But there was something else that I'd heard about conservation camp that caught my attention. I, I, I understood that one night for supper at conservation camp, they served rattlesnake. And I'd never tasted rattlesnake, so I thought I'd like to try rattlesnake. But there were two things that made conservation camp just legendary. One was the snake roundup. And the other was the snake bite club. Uh, now, the way the snake roundup worked is uh, we'd ridden school buses from all over to get to conservation camp. I'd ridden a uh, school bus from the mountains of East Tennessee all the way down to Memphis. Tennessee's a very wide state. It, it, it was nine hours on the school bus. That's a bad ride. Don't ever take it. But I took it. But on the night of the snake roundup, we, all the kids got back on the school buses, and they drove us out to a swampy area right outside of Memphis. And they set us out. And we spent the night wading through the swamp, catching snakes. Now, now can you imagine how that'd go today? <laughs> I mean, you, you wouldn't as much as get the kids on the bus. Somebody would file a lawsuit. They'd shut that operation down. But I'm telling you, in 1983, you could literally fill school buses full of kids, dump them in a swamp, tell them to catch snakes all night, and get away with it. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. Well, it was the next day when, when the, the moment that we'd all been waiting for in that week of camp finally came around. Because the next day, one of the camp counselors took some of the non-venomous, the non-poisonous snakes we'd caught the night before, and he put them in a pillowcase. And he carried them all around the camp. And any camper who wanted to voluntarily uh, could join the snake bite club. It was a rather simple process. You put your hand in the pillowcase, you're inducted. Uh, but the problem is, by the time the camp counselor finally got down to uh, the cabin where I was staying, where, where we'd thawed the beaver out in the bathtub, it was all the way down at the end of the row of cabins. And apparently the snakes were tired of biting at that point because <laughs> I mustered up my courage and I stuck my hand down that pillowcase and nothing happened. And I looked at the camp counselor and I was like, nothing's happening. What do I do? He said, well, pull one out. And so I fish around a little bit and I get a hold of one and I pull it out. He's hanging there from my hand about as disinterested in me as my teenage daughter's. Nothing's going on. And so I asked him, I said, well, what do I do now? He said, well, slap him. <laughs> now, in case you didn't know, I assume you did, but in case you didn't know, snakes don't like to be slapped. Because when I slapped him, he slapped me back. It was a toothy slap right on the back of my hand. And that's the day I joined the Snake Bite Club. And that is a true story. Because it's a true story, I need to make two very quick uh, qualifiers. One, that was not church camp. <laughs> I'm from a little further back in the mountains than you folk. We had those churches in our community. I, I, that's, I'm not that kind of Baptist. <laughs> it wasn't church camp, it was conservation camp. Uh, but, but the second thing you need to know is that that was not my first induction into the snake bike club. Truth is, I was born a member of that club. Lots of references in the Bible to serpents, snakes, vipers, asps. The first comes early on. You remember it, don't you? The old serpent slithers into the garden to tempt the woman and the man to do what God had told them explicitly not to do. And they did it. Disobeying God, they sinned. And from that moment on, everything changed. We refer to it as the fall. 
the moment sin entered the world. And we see there in Genesis 3 the consequences of sin upon all creation, upon the serpent, upon the man and the woman, and the generations to come. In fact, as God curses the serpent and the man and the woman, in Genesis 3.15, God states that he will put enmity between the serpent and the man and the woman and between their offspring. And you see the consequences of sin following in the very next generation as the sons of Adam and Eve are now born into sin, conceived in sin, the Bible says, of everyone since the fall, but they also willingly choose to sin, and Cain murders his own brother. Lostness from the moment that sin entered the world, spiritual brokenness in relationship with the Creator became the world's greatest problem. It was not just true for Adam and Eve, it was true for their children, and every generation is to follow. Fast forward to the days of Noah, and God brings judgment upon the earth through the flood because of the sinfulness of the people. Fast forward to the days of the prophets, and the people are continuing to rebel against God, and God through the prophets warns of coming judgment. But even then, God begins to speak about a solution to the world's greatest problem as he began through the prophets to speak of a Messiah who would come and die for the sins of the people. But every generation that has followed, this problem has continued. In fact, lostness is a greater problem in our world today and in our generation than it has ever been in human history. Why would I say that? One year ago, the population on planet Earth crossed 8 billion. Imagine that. And of those 8 billion, more are lost today than have ever been. Our research team at the IMB keeps track of a number for me. They update it each year. It's the number of people who every day pass away, having given no indication that they've heard the gospel, or if they've heard it, that they believed it that they've been saved. That number from last year to this year took its largest jump in human history. Today, 173,000 people will enter eternity lost. Having given no indication they've heard the gospel or if they've heard it that they believed it. And according to what the Bible teaches, that means they will be forever separated from God in hell. 173,000 people today and again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, every single day. There is no greater problem in the world than that problem. No problem even begins to rival that problem because it's an eternal problem, but it's also a universal problem. It's everyone's problem. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But praise God, there's a solution to the problem. If you were to ask me, North Roanoke Church, why are you here? I would say that when it comes down to the real purpose that God has given you, the purpose can be simply explained as this. You're here to address the world's greatest problem because you know the solution. If you were to ask me why the IMB exists, I'd tell you the same thing. The IMB exists to send your missionaries to address the world's greatest problem. We know the solution. By the way, the IMB is hiring today. Uh, Students, if you want to spend a semester or summer with us, a gap year, we'd love to talk with you. Young people under the age of 30, we've got a two-year fully funded program called the Journeyman Program. We'd love to talk to you about that. We're sending career missionaries. Hey, we're sending more retirees today at the IMB. It really doesn't matter what your uh, career path has been, what you have done or what you are doing. We can use it somewhere. We can use a retired uh, doctor or nurse or police officer or IT worker, a retired farmer. Hey, listen, we can even use retired lawyers at the IMB. (laughs) So uh, whatever you've done in life, seriously, there's a way we can use that to share the gospel around the world. And we'd love to talk with you because this is the reality. 
The world has a problem, but we know the solution. What is that solution? It's fascinating. When Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus who he, Jesus, is and, and why he had come, and Nicodemus is struggling to understand the gospel and what Jesus would do for him. Jesus told Nicodemus, hey, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, how do you do that? How you go back in your mother's womb? I'm an old man. How do you do that? And Jesus is like, no, 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 you, you misunderstand me. And to help Nicodemus understand, it's fascinating that Jesus tells Nicodemus a snake story. You would find it there in John 3. It's a reference to another Old Testament passage. And this one at a time when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. They were on their way uh, from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. But that generation, like every generation, was sinning and rebelling against God. And God brought judgment upon them in the form of deadly vipers, poisonous snakes that invaded the camps of the Israelites. And snakes were biting the people and the people were dying. But the Israelites, seeing the consequences of their sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. They began to cry out to God for mercy. And Moses, their leader, cried out on their behalf. And God, who is a merciful God, provided a solution. You remember what that solution was? He said, Moses fashion a, a, a serpent, a snake out of bronze and put it on a pole and lift it up in the camp. And anyone who's bitten by one of these deadly poisonous vipers, they won't die like everyone else has died. No, if they'll look at that serpent of bronze, they'll live. Now Jesus references that story to Nicodemus. And here's what he says in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. He says, Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And any who look to him will have eternal life. And he was lifted up on the cross where he died for your sin and my sin. And the sins of the world. And the Bible says anyone who believes that, who's willing to put their trust in Jesus and what he did on that cross and that he was raised from the dead three days later, we call that faith. Anyone who is willing to turn from their life of sin and turn to Jesus as a Savior, we call that repentance. And confess him as Lord because he is Lord. The Bible says at that very moment your greatest problem will be saved. It will be solved. Because at that very moment, your sin will be forgiven. At that very moment, you'll be adopted into the Father's family. And at that very moment, your eternal destination will change. No longer headed for hell, separation from God who is love, the Spirit who is comfort, Jesus uh, who is life, and Christ who is our joy. No, you won't be separated. You'll be welcomed into his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, the solution to the world's greatest problem is the gospel. And God has given us this good news to share. And yet billions of people around the world have never heard it. And that's why we're still here. And that's why we must go. Several years ago, there was a couple of men in a Baptist church uh, showed up in the church parking lot on a weekday evening it was a church similar to this one and the fact that it was a Baptist church with a parking lot. <laughs> uh, it was a little different uh, in the sense that that church and the parking lot would just about fit into this gymnasium, just a little church in a little town in the mountains. They came on a weekday evening because it was church visitation night. Amen. And they set out to do what they'd come to do. They just walking through the town, the little neighborhoods, and knocking on doors, inviting people to come to church on Sunday. One point in the evening, they climbed a steep hill, made their way up to a little rental house at the address of 210 Province Street. Stepped up on the porch, knocked on the door. Young man came to the door in his mid-twenties. I don't know if they knew his situation. It was a small town. They may have known all about his situation. You know how small towns are, but had they 
known much about him. They'd have known he was about two years past a divorce. And he was raising his three kids on his own. I don't know if they knew any of that. What they could not have possibly known is that the four-year-old somewhere in the house there that night would someday be the president of the International Mission Board. They couldn't have known that. But they knew enough. They knew enough to know broken families need the Lord. And people not in church need to be in church. And God has a solution for every person's greatest problem. And so when Dad went to the door, they invited him to church. The next Sunday, he managed to get three rowdy boys ready on his own, and he took us to church. We went to Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, it soon became the pattern of our family. And what we found there was the same thing I found when I pulled up in the parking lot here. We found a church family who warmly welcomed us, and that loved us, and shared the gospel with us. A few years later, there's another knock at our door. We still live in that little rental house. Dad went to the door. Our pastor was standing there. Dad invited him in. He'd, he'd ask him if he'd drop by one evening if he had time. Because my older brother had been asking questions about the gospel. So Brother Allen sat in the green chair in the corner of our living room. And he shared the gospel with my older brother. My younger brother and I, we were sitting on the floor and we were listening. And Brother Allen got three for one that night. Amen. So we put our trust in Jesus. Say, baptized a few weeks later in the baptist of the little First Baptist Church of Jellico, Tennessee. I can't tell you how thankful I am for a couple of men out knocking on doors who cared enough about their neighbors to tell them, I know the solution to your greatest problem. How grateful I am for a pastor like Pastor Daniel, whose greatest joy it was to share the gospel with one who needed to believe. How thankful I am for that little church. I knew why it was there. And how grateful I am to be in a church like that today. North Roanoke, don't forget why you're here. You wouldn't have to go far to the parking lot. You'd find a broken family. Lost man, woman, boy, girl. You know what their greatest problem is. And you know the solution to it. Get on a plane with us, the IMB, we'll show you billions of people like that. That's why we're here. Don't forget why you're here. We invite you to stand. As we come this morning to a time of commitment, the worship leader's going to be coming. Your pastor will be here at the front. Today, as you've thought about the message, or maybe in recent days, the way the Lord's been speaking to you, you've realized, hey, I've got a problem. <laughs> if I were to die today, I, I have no reason to believe that heaven will be my eternal home, because I know I've sinned. But today you recognize God has done everything that needs to be done in Christ to solve that problem, and you're ready today to put your trust in Him. If that's the case, we want to ask you as we sing, you come forward, share that with Pastor Daniel. We, we want to rejoice with you. Maybe you have questions. What, what does that mean? What does that take? He can answer those questions. Maybe the Lord is leading you to be a part of this church family that knows why it's here and would welcome you to join hands with them and sharing the gospel in this community. Maybe the Lord's put the nations on your heart. And today you'd want to learn about what it's like to go. I'd love to talk to you about that. I'll be here on the front row. It's not my invitation, though. It's not the invitation of the church. The Lord is the one who invites. You respond to Him and then come. Share your response with us.
the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hand. his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan Could you be seated for just a quick moment? Um, I got several announcements I want to share with you and then a, a quick presentation before we go. I want to begin by saying 173,000. Uh, that's, that's sobering. And there's some in this room who are still a part of that 173,000. And you've been coming faithfully, you've been hearing the gospel. Man, if you have questions about that illustration... Uh, that was shared with Nicodemus. The Son of Man had to be lifted up. He was bitten by the snake, so you don't have to be. So he, can, he took the venom out of the bite so that you can be rescued. And uh, what a mighty, incredible Savior that is. If you have questions about the gospel, about Christ, we're so thankful that you're coming. But, but don't go and not hear the gospel and, and turn from your sin and trust in Christ. We, we have no greater joy than to see you come to saving faith in Christ. And secondly, if you want to be a part of the solution, not just in the Roanoke Valley, but around the world, Dr. Chitwood has said he'll, he'll be here. Uh, he would love to talk to you about that. And uh, if you're nervous to talk to him, then write it on a card, on, on the card that says, sign me up to serve and put on in there IMB. That's, that's not an option, but put it on there. We have been praying since 2017 for God to raise up five or more missionary units 
uh, to be on the field or in training with the International Mission Board by 2030. It's 2023, last I checked. Uh, God is already working. We've got some people in the pipeline, but maybe he wants to add you to that. Maybe he wants you to be an answer to prayer in going. I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, in, th- in the way of announcements, next Sunday after our service, um, well, yeah, thank you. I'm out of order. Next Sunday after the service, we will have our congregation-wide vote uh, on the 2024 budget. Copies have been available for like the last month out at the Welcome Center, but if you need to grab one and evaluate that, uh, we'll have a vote at the close of service. This Wednesday, we'll have caroling. Uh, We'll go and see some of our seniors and shut-ins. We'll divide into groups and then come back here about 8 o'clock for donuts and hot chocolate. Amen. Uh, Student ministry has a lot going on in December, so parents, if you could just make note of those dates. Um, The winter retreat I'm looking forward to. Ethan's been beginning to prepare and plan for that. I'm excited about the content they're going to get. That that again is the 27th through the 29th of December. And then our Christmas Eve worship service will be right here in the gym at 530. Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, right? So we'll have worship at our regular time. We will not have our 3D groups that day. So we'll come, we'll have coffee, donuts, refreshments, worship together at 1030 and then be back at 530 for our special Christmas Eve worship service. And don't stack chairs just yet. Um, Dr. Chilwood, if you don't mind, I'd like you to to come forward if that's okay. Um, On behalf of North Roanoke Baptist Church, church family, you... I tell you, you support the IMB and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering every week. 100% of that gift goes directly to funding missionaries and their children uh, who are serving, uh, many of them in dangerous situations, uh, but serving faithfully. 3,550 missionaries and how many children? 2,700. 2,700 kids that you're a part of blessing. And uh, so I get to present to Dr. Chipwood and to the IMB a check in the amount of $16,000 today to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Lord. Lord bless you, brother. Thank you. God bless Thank you. you. So much. Thank, Thank you. As we, uh, as we close, um, why don't we pray uh, for Dr. Chipwood, for the International Mission Board, once again for the progress of the gospel as we seek to penetrate lostness with the greatest solution ever heard. God, our Father in heaven, you've inspired us this morning with a reminder of something that we already knew. But God, we we confess it's so easy to, to block out the greatest problem because it's It's so massive. It's so enduring. It's so universal. And yet, God, you have sent a solution. And you have saved a people. And you have saved us not to just sit in a pew, but to be sent out and to be spent for your glory, whether that's here or around the world or somewhere in between. So God, we ask that you would answer our prayer, that you would continue to raise up men and women to go from North Roanoke Baptist Church, that you would bless and prosper the ministries of the 3,550 missionaries that we are supporting today and every Sunday. And God, we ask for strength and endurance and courage for Dr. Chitwood and all that he leads. God, that you would do more than they could ever hope or ask or imagine. God, that you would exceed their greatest expectation, that Worldwide revival would be something that would happen and that the International Mission Board and the 47,000 churches partnering with them would be a part of it. And we pray it for the glory of Christ because He's worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can help us stack chairs, we'd appreciate it. God bless you. You are dismissed.